awesome. Y'all looking good. Looking good. Man, we have some special activities today. We're about to have uh, children's and babies and dedication. Is that good? Yeah. Yeah, it's a real powerful time. And there's several of you that have already registered. If you have, would you just kind of make your way up, up this way? Um, if you have, if you wanted to be a part of the baby dedication today, and uh, we're going to continue with the next phase. This got real awkward. Everybody left me. That, like, that's weird. But uh, today, if you have, if, you, if you've brought, if, if you've come today and you registered and you would love or have not registered and would love to get in on it, we want to see, we believe in God's going to do great and incredible things. And uh, lost the band. All the band is so full of kids. They're everywhere. But uh, so cool. So cool. Come up. Yeah, lead, lead the pack, Danae. I don't know how to come. Up here. Up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Wow. So good. You put my kids to sleep back there, I see. Awesome. You would. I guess I got left to do all this, huh? Let's see. Just line up, dude. You're going to be with me. Awesome. Wow. This is so, so good. Our parents and grandparents and all kind of stuff going on. You know, we knew there was a, um, there once was a time two years ago I think it was two years ago, maybe in three years ago, um, that children were a real struggle within the church. Not a struggle for the church, a struggle for parents. And, um, you know, and sometimes we try, maybe some of y'all are uh, my age or older, and you grew up in the way of, you know what, let's, uh, hey, teach our kids from a very early age to come to church, shut up, be good, teach them respect, and sit through it. And if, if your child was like me, I mean, I just fell in a chair to go up under and sleep. And, um, you know, wasn't the place I ever wanted to be as a result. But uh, we decided a couple years ago, actually through a mom we saw reaching and striving and striving to make a decision to follow Christ, but it was just too much. And we changed things up and a team come together to say children's church. And so that's where usually the majority of the children are during this time. That's where the older children are at this time. Um, but, wow, what a difference it makes whenever you open things up and begin to provide life-giving experiences for the children then all of a sudden, look at all the parents that are raising the children to know the Lord. That is so incredible. So incredible. How are you doing? Cool. Well, awesome. What we're going to do is uh, really, you know, to rate to dedication of the children is what it is going on is the parents are deciding, you know what? We are taking the lead and we are not parents who just trust our kids to be raised off everybody else and we're not just trusting our kids even to just be raised by the church the parents are deciding you know what we are the church and we bring the church into our home and wherever we go and raising our children in that honor and so really the baby dedication we're going to pray this is really a commissioning time uh for the parents we're going to share a couple of verses and our desire is you know what that each of these children will grow up they will make their own decision to follow jesus and to, you know what, they won't have a lot of stories like my testimony and maybe some others in here of like what we come from, but they will say what God grew them up to be. And we believe also, you know what, that they will find their spouses within the context of the church as well and find things that start from the beginning. So uh, it is awesome to begin moving in. Man, we had like five people registered this morning and such a thing. You know what I love? I love the kids that crawl or the parents that brought donuts to feed all the rest of our kids. That's awesome. That's why I said don't give my kids any more donuts. That's good. Let me read you guys a couple of verses. And, uh, and we're going to ask the whole congregation to join in and celebrate. And the parents are going to be praying for peace in a minute. In Psalms 127, 34, it says, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is when his quiver is full of them. And saying, that, you know what, the children are, are there, you're raising them and you're shooting them in a direction. You're defining the destiny of their life. You're defining the direction of their life. Your influence is what is shaping where they're going. And Deuteronomy says, these commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts to the adults and press them on your children. I love this. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Time, time, a Jesus story in everything that we do. A lot, one that everybody knows is, it says this for the parents. says, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. 
I believe that's a promise that, you know what, no matter what a child goes through in their younger days, that's a promise. You know what, there's, there's a lasso, there's a loop coming back. And the last one I'm going to share is Proverbs 29, 15. It says, a child left to himself comes to ruin. So raise a child in the way that he should go. A child left to himself comes to ruin. Wow, we've got too many to do, too many uh, introductions here. So uh, I'll tell you what, would you, uh, where is, Todd, are you around here? Would you come up here please, sir? And uh, what I just want to ask you to join me and can I ask you guys what we're doing? We're a church, we're a family. And I love Becca, this was so your idea. And look what, what God did. Love it, love it, love it. She's like, I want to dedicate my, my, my daughter. And look what you created a following. Love faith steps. So praise God. Todd, I want to ask you, man, would you pray for the children, pray for the parents? Would you as a church, could we extend hands and reach out? I believe, you know what, God uses all of us. It is all of our prayers. And, uh, sitting out here behind me, Father, that you would use each one of them to raise these children up according to the way you want them to go and the thing that you want them to do and the life that you have them called for. As Pastor Danny was talking a while ago, so their testimony would be what God did for them instead of what he brought them from and brought them through. So we know you do that, but it's so much nicer than when you just lead us without us having to go through a bunch of junk. So we thank you and we praise you for it. And pray for each one of these parents in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know what? We're going to see the stories. And uh, I want to ask you guys to write this date down because when they're 15 and 16 and 23, we're going to hear these stories and hear what God began and what He sowed in each heart in here today. Believe that. You believe that, church? Are you ready? Yeah. Awesome. Well, may, may the Lord be with you, may He bless you and keep you and raise you up healthy and strong and all diseases be healed and the destinies be guarded and protected and led by the Lord in Jesus' name. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Wow. This is, huh? Please. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm so glad for everybody that came today. Thank you, man. Can we give one more hand clap to the parents? Because do you realize it's daylight savings time of the weekend, and they still got kids ready in the morning. There's a lot to be said of that. Who, who, said, who said daylight savings time knocks people down? They don't know what they're talking about. Well, praise God. Man, excited, looking forward to the future. Thank you so much for putting over some parking issues. Uh, and everything as you're here today. If you got in later, uh, as soon as the river goes down, we'll help that situation out. But uh, the river is our enemy right now. So, uh, just to let you know, please don't let fight the traffic. Keep fighting traffic, and we'll get it settled soon. So, uh, man, can we pray together as a church right now? Would you pray with me if I lead and say, Lord Jesus, lead me, guide me, help me to see myself as you see me today. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Well, my name is Danny. I get to do a lot of talking around here. So uh, there, there's my introduction. And it's so glad to have you. I'll tell you what, no matter where you come from, we appreciate you today. Know that you could have been rolling over in the bed. You could have been watching grass grow. You could, you could have been Netflix being and saying, it's cloudy and I don't go to church in the rain. You could have come up with anything in the world. You could have been thinking about mowing my grass before it gets any wetter. I don't know. But instead, you made an effort and you put one leg in front of the other and you got out and you went through what you went through and you're here. And there's a lot to be said of that. And you know what? We want to honor your time in that and say thank you so much for being here. It really is a great and an incredible honor. So what we do here is typically um, we, t we talk in series. We're in week two of a series called Overcomer right now. And we talk in series, it goes anywhere three to four weeks, depending on what the series is. And what a series does is we take a topic or a book and it just kind of keeps everybody on the same flow, the same page, keeps everybody in the same conversation, in the same pattern. So you know what, you never have to feel like an outsider, everybody is instantly an insider because we're all running the same lane. 
And so what we did last week, we talked about, you know what, facing the truth and saying that, you know what, we take first steps so often in our faith. We take a first step, a first giant leap of faith sometimes on things that it may not be big to the person next to you, but it's big to you. It's, 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 it's taking radical audacious and said the only way to actually overcome fear is to take a radical audacious step of faith and unlearn what we cannot do. Unlearn what is impossible again. So, you know, Jesus taught that anything is possible if we believe. And yet the tendency so often is sometimes because of the past experience, because of the emotion or the feeling of the moment, we'll turn around and verbalize the impossibilities of the future. Because of the our past experience, a current feeling, and sometimes we'll predict an impossibility going forward. And we can teach ourselves that everything beyond what we've done already is impossible. And so hope is over and life is done, even though we exist. But Jesus said, with him, anything is possible. So he said, we're going to take a radical faith step and unlearn the lies. This week, what we're going to do is we're going to dive into what happens when we start contemplating that step, when we actually begin getting close to it. But next week, I'm really excited because next week, we're going to start dealing with the disappointments that come. How many of you realize, no matter what it is, when you make a choice, it doesn't always turn out like you thought. I remember Callie and I, uh, we were going to buy our very first house um, years ago, and we got all stoked, and we were excited. We went, and we, we done made a deposit on it, and thankfully, we had a very nice real estate lady who was not happy with us at all when we backed out, and because we got into it, we were young and naive, and just like, hey, it has, br- it has walls and a roof. Surely, this is awesome, and God's leading, and then like the house, if you walk through it, it kind of like half of it went like this, but... Um, and it just took somebody with common sense walking through and, and almost rolling downhill. And they're like, you sure you want to get into this? And, uh, you know, young and married and just making the pennies work. It's like, we can't scrap any more pennies to uh, do anything once we get in here. And I'm so glad we got protected from that. But, you know what, sometimes when we take steps, there are disappointments that come. That's where we'll go next week, how to overcome, even when it's a failure. So, it, last week, we rolled in and we talked about this guy named Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah starts with this radical prayer. He has his heart broke over a situation we're going to reveal. He has his heart broke over what's going on, what he hears about happens to his family and to some of his country. And he wanted to do something about it. Back home, everyone is living with the belief of they've been, they've been sent off as slaves and they've come back. God has rescued him. He told him, even though you, you made your own choices and got sent as far as far can go, he says, when you repent, turn to me, call to me, I will restore you no matter how far away you are. And so in the midst of that, they get restored. They come back, even though they made the choices to send them away. And when they come back, they come back, but everything's in shambles. Everything is ruined. They have walls that were their protection around the city. They lay in as a dump. Uh, looks like it cannot be repaired. They got a temple that's broken. They got their homes that are just shacks. And, you know, it's kind of like you get, sometimes you make steps for the people of Nehemiah's day. It's like we got home and we got our, all of our stuff back, but what good is it? If it's going to be like this, maybe you've been in similar situations where perhaps maybe you've been in a marriage and you wonder, but what good is it if we stay together, if we fight all the time? Or maybe you thought, you know what, what good is it to forgive and take a step forward if everybody keeps thinking, I'm going to go back to who I was? What good, have you ever, have you ever had the like, the what good is it thoughts? Like, you know, what, what does it even matter? And so Nehemiah, he gets fired up and he's going to do something. And he prays this and he says, God, grant me success today because I'm about to do something. I'm going to risk my life for these people that don't even know that I'm coming. And then he does nothing. Like, there's nothing to be made successful because he doesn't do anything. And so for four months, he just hangs out. Do you know what that's like to... To get around what inspires the best in you, to maybe get in an environment that perhaps breaks your heart, to be involved in in something that would bring a change to someone else. Either way, you walk away overwhelmed going, I'm going for it. I'm going for it. I'm going to do something. This week, you know, it it could be something like, this week, you know what, God's moved on my heart. I'm done with smoking. I'm done with drugs this week. I'm not dragging it on anymore. It could be, you know what, it could drop back and say, I'm not hanging out, giving myself away to one desperate relationship after another anymore. I'm breaking away. Maybe, you know what, maybe it's something radical like saying, I'm 
not even going to complain. I'm just, I'm tired of the way that always drags me down. I'm done complaining. I'm, I'm done gossiping. It could be something like that. Or it could be like, you know what? I'm getting elected for something. I'm going to make a difference. I'm telling my friends, my family about what Jesus has done. Or I'm going to join on a dream team in the church and get involved and giving life to other people. Maybe I, I'm going to do something. Have you ever gotten to that Papa moment in your life? You remember Papa? Where he finally, oh, oh, Bluto would take olive oil only so many times, then he finally gets enough is enough is enough, and he says, and that's all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. You ever get to this in your life? It's like, I can't stand it no more. I got to do something. I can't stand sitting silent. I can't, I can't stand being vocal only. I'm taking some action. I'm about to do something. And that's great. But have you ever gotten so emotionally involved to still walk away and do nothing? And it seems so real. It hurts. It hurts, it hurts, doesn't it, when, when you have God stirring up some, a calling in us and then do nothing. In church world, if, you've been, if you grew up in church, we'd call this camp or call this revival or call this a conference. You know, people are like, yeah, man, it's awesome. That was so good. Oh, man, I'm telling you, that was refreshing. And, you know, if it's kids level camp, they're just coming back there fired up and until they go to school or their parents tell them to clean their room. And then it like goes out the door. And so what we do as a, in a society is we teach that, oh, that's just events that happen that really don't mean anything when really they're a birthing ground that God has began something. And it's just our duty to continue to make the steps. There's not hot spots. There's a hot, hot spirit that he grows and he builds in us. You know, it hurts, to, it hurts to have God stir in us. It hurts to have God leading and then to do nothing. It hurts to believe actually the I think the most hurtful part sometimes is believing our own self and looking and saying you know what I feel like I finally got some courage I got some gumption but then to see that we bowed again to the fears of what if it doesn't work and what if I end up alone and what if I fail and if I can be very transparent with you every single step I take in in my head there's there's a thousand voices that are heckling saying but what if you fail but what if you fail what if you fail? And I may start, if you, were, if you were able to see all my thoughts and all the things that go on in my head, you would see like a hundred attempts, you know, like, I'm doing something to see 99 do nothing. And then maybe one something out of a hundred. It's just, it's, it's a battle that, go, that can go, go on in, in humanity. Uh, you know, the, some of the battle that weighs in my mind is you're like, what if my children grow up? And they don't understand some of the choices I made was the choices to be their father rather than just their friend because I cared more about where they were going than where they were in the moment. We're trying to grow and raise somewhere. What if, you know, what, what, if, what if Callie and I make decisions that we think are good and we end up losing everything? And then all of a sudden to, to a community, we lose all credibility because people assume, said, oh yeah, that's just God's finally bringing the truth out. And, and, and it appears like it's unfaithful when it was the, the intentions were completely pure. Imagine. What if people get the wrong idea from the right intention? Imagine Nehemiah. And the amazing thing is, he never struggled with the worry of what choosing the comfortable life was doing. He never worried about the destruction that was happening slowly. Like we often don't acknowledge the slow death that is happening while we're pushing off a decision. But what would happen if his bold actions failed? That was his concern. We usually don't worry about the destruction of doing nothing but the failure of doing something. But after four months, he does this audacious thing. And he tells the king. The king says, what's wrong with you, boy? He says, king, I got to let you know. He says, I want to go home. And I want to be there for like a really long time. And I know you have control over my coming and going. And I know I forfeited all my freedom to choose to be your servant. I could have went, but I chose to stay in slavery rather than the freedom that I had been given. And so now I know that I'm risking my life as I'm asking you this, but I'm telling you, if you're asking me what I'm wanting to do, I want to go home, and not only do I want to go home, I want to stay there for a really, really long time. And not only that, I'm asking you to pay for it, I'm asking you to get all the supplies together, and I'm asking you to send an army to protect me and to carry all this stuff. And the most amazing thing happened. In Nehemiah 2.8, the very last line says, And the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. And wouldn't it be awesome if, like, the beginning of every single step was the first step? You know, it's just like, 
I did it. Awesome. And wouldn't it be great if the good news was like a portrayal of everything that is ahead, you know, that, that energy. That would, man, that would just be great. But what happens next? So often. I mean, it'd be beautiful to live so free that once we took a single step, everything just followed in place like water going down a stream. I mean, wouldn't it be beautiful to know that if you just say yes to Jesus, it means that all the clouds go away and every step that matters is just everything is going to fall right into place and everything is just going to miraculously just work out and you just sit there and just keep flipping the Netflix and it just keeps popping into place. I mean, that would be incredible. But watch what happens. Because there are two guys that give Nehemiah trouble from the very first day. And not just the first day, but for the first 12 years. It's like they don't know how to let up. In Nehemiah 2.10, we get introduced to these guys named Samballot and Tob- Tobiah. But when Samballot the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard my arrival, I just got into town. They were very displeased that someone had actually come to help the people of Israel. Do you realize there is a world of people that will accept you as long as you don't do anything that matters? As the church... We're not worried about risking being misunderstood and, and, and falling a prey to, to criticism because, you know what, our desire is not to reach church people. Our desire is to reach the un- uncommitted and the undecided and the unchurched people of the region and to lead them to be passionate followers of Christ. And so in that, you receive some criticism here and there. There is a world of people that will accept you as long as you don't do anything that matters. But when we, there's something amazing that happens when you, when you, when you quit dope. When you decide, you know what, we're busting up, we're going to live, we're going to live separately until the day we get married. We're going at this thing right. When, we, when you decide, you know what, I'm not letting my kids just go anywhere anymore because I don't know what happens and I care more about them than just this moment. And all of a sudden, when we begin making decisions that actually matter, it's like the moment you give a meal to someone else in that moment, instead of sharing the 12 pack that normally did in the days gone by, and you, instead now you share an invite, all of a sudden now you're a fake lying, arrogant, self-righteous hypocrite. And it's like, the moment that you spend the day with someone that has used others and provide meal to an alcoholic, and you, uh, you, have, or you reach out to someone who has not, not ever given one single good indication, just seemed completely hopeless in every single case because they did not know what hope was and that hope was accessible through Jesus. All of a sudden now, you're wasting your time and you're wasting your breath. You're wasting all that little Jesus church motivation, whatever, all that little compassion you're trying to act like you got. You know, I want you to know with that person, you're just wasting your time. It, there, there's, you, there ain't anything good. In, who do you think you are? I mean, like you're really going to do something. But the same people never had a complaint when I was destroying my life. It's amazing, isn't it? You can, be, you, can, you can be on a path to fast death and nobody cares, but you start spreading life around and all of a sudden all the critics come out. Opinions. And you know what? Here's the thing. If you're average, you'll forget who you have become and that Jesus is indeed real in you. If you're average, we'll begin fighting like who we were when we were miserable with who we had. If we're average, we will go back to old tactics an old problem to fight our new battles. But none of you are average. Opinions don't ever stop, ever. But know this, if you took a step of faith, the beauty of it is, in the eyes of God Almighty, no longer average. There is no average. You know what? If you're, you're beginning to live as an overcomer, so you didn't take the other 99 steps, but you took the one. Praise God for the one. Who who we are in Jesus now has no concern for who we were before. So you're now, when we become to the moment of salvation, faith in Jesus that gives salvation, we are, as it says in Romans 8, 37, that we are now more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. It says, the writer in Romans 8, 37 says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. I love that he starts off with this. No! No! In all these things, we're more than kind. And that's, that's great, but you know, it says despite all these things, despite all these things. But there's a, I like the end of it, but the beginning of it needs some attention. All these things, like what are these things then? Well, you got to drop back into verse 36 and check this out. It says that the scriptures say, for your sake, 
For your sake, we are killed every day. For your sake, we are being slaughtered like sheep. For your sake, we are taken out every single day. And then he rolls into verse 37 and he goes, Ah, oh, but no! Despite all of these things, overwhelming victory, despite that we're getting killed every day, despite that we are overwhelming victory is ours through Christ, despite that we are like sheep with no kind of weaponry, getting to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are not the slaughtered and we are not the dead. We are the victorious. Even though we are dying, we have got the victory in every situation. Something changes about every part of our being when we realize, with no regard for who we are, with no regard for what we are facing and no regard for what we are considered, that no single circumstance and no single rejection matters because Jesus, with Jesus, you are more than a conqueror. If you would, just high five about three people and say, you are more than. You are more than. You are more than. Can we say this? Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when your intentions are the most sincere. Or if you're a brother, I'm noticing from the pulpit up here, if you're a brother to a sister, give him a good slug. But I'm not going to point it out. Um, anyway, man, them opportunities. I was a little brother. I love them opportunities. But don't be surprised when your intentions are the most sincere is when you will get accused of being the worst. But you know what? It's a place you get to shine from. You get to be a light in the darkness. And get to return kindness for bitterness. And get to return forgiveness for anger. And get to return blessing for insult. It's an opportunity to shine. Before Callie and I were married, there was always, I always had a desire towards her. Uh, from the time I met her, which was actually like right there where you're sitting, Natalie, is where I met her for the first time. And I was right here and I saw her and I was like, man, I need to get to know her. And, uh, and by, that was on a Monday. By Friday, I was getting to know her. And, uh, you know, I was like, this is the woman I'm going to marry. And then when I got closer and I walked away, uh, I found out she was 16 and I was 21. So I was like, you know, maybe I better back up. <laughs> um, there, there's, so there's this desire that was going on for a while. And, uh, and I remember when I got, when actually she got 19, I figured, hey, she's graduated school, we can marry her now. And so she's 19, and we're about to, we're working towards getting married, and we, I'd already, we began uh, dating, we called it courting at that time, which was, sounds real weird. Um, um, but the benefits, it worked out really, really great. Um, we actually, see, we understood that one thing leads to another, and, and lust burns, and it burns harder and harder. So we understood that from the get-go, so we just made a decision, you know what, that we won't even uh, know what a kiss is like between each other until the preacher says, you may kiss the bride. And it was just, a, it, was, it was a guardrail, it was a guide, and it sounds weird, but the benefits are great. And also, I'll say this, if you want to just kind of lean toward that holy side, and you're wanting to get married, it helps make engagement short. So... Um, you, you have motivation. But one day, but one day I remember we were, we were rolling all along. We went out a little bit and someone decided that I needed some correction. I needed some guidance. I needed, so they decided Callie needed protection and I needed advice. And you know how it is when you need it, when somebody knows you need advice? You also need an audience. Because, I mean, what good is it to critique and correct you if there's not a bunch of people around to go, yeah, uh-huh, that's right. You know, it's completely wasted. So always make sure and have a crowd when you're going to be critical. Um, just kidding. Don't do that. That's evil. But um, so anyway, they began to tell me, said, you better. I want to tell you something. This is what I was told. I want to tell you something. I'm like, okay. You better not mess around with this girl. You better not hurt her. I was like, all right. And I listened and said, you, you better not do that. If you're not, if you don't be leading this girl on, then go. If you're going to go, go now. I was like, all right. I was thinking to myself, what part, what am I supposed to do to prove my sincere desire and love and that I've matured at least a little fraction of a bit past stupid? No matter, but I found out no matter what, people assume the worst. No, the, 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 the criticism had no regard that I'd asked her dad could I marry her before I ever asked her out. But they weren't involved in that part of the story. I just wanted to be in part when there was a show around. You know what I've learned? Everybody has an opinion. And if their opinion is allowed to swing our moods and allow, allows us to create defenses, 
You know what? There's not enough medication invented yet that will help us. Nehemiah risked his life. The king sends the army into town. This is a long venture. The king sends not only the army, but the army loaded down with supplies. They show up on barges traveling across land, if you can kind of picture it. Nehemiah risked his life when he faced the king and asked for these things. Nehemiah has a God-given desire that he couldn't shake. And so what if he did nothing for four months? After four months, he's like, I can't stand it anymore. And he gets to the town that he has not seen in forever. It's where his family is. He's got heritage. He has some old neighbors. He used to ride bikes with some people. I mean, he, he's back in town. And he get, but he gets there and everything is in shambles. And he sees all the impossibilities. And he develops, instead of seeing it and going, oh man, it's too much to go home. Instead, he develops a plan. And he develops a plan of how to restore the people. He wasn't there to build mama's house back up. He was there to build the city back up. And he says this in Nehemiah 2.17. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruin and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. And they are all like, yeah, let's do it. And they get started. I don't know if you know what it they realize this or not, but really the battle is not so much the wall. But winning the battle was really just that last three words. And let's end this disgrace. We can build a lot of buildings and we can build a lot of fences and we can build a lot of, we can build a lot of careers and we can build a lot of things. But there's something that God puts in every single person when He calls you. When you're drawn to Him, He's wired you in some form to bring his, his motion into your area that will end the disgrace for people all around. They accused, uh, if you, I don't if you realize, this, that's the whole battle. They, remember Jesus? They accused Jesus of every single evil they could think of. Because what he was doing was restoring people back to God the Father. It was a relationship that had a disgrace. It was a relationship that had been broken and destroyed and the bridges were burned. And instead of the separation, Jesus shows up and He restores us to the Father and He ends the shame by going to the cross and resurrecting from the tomb. Jesus ended it. The stuff that maybe you feel like you're scared and you quit, Jesus ended the disqualification that we carry after that. You know what? The stuff that you think it will take a long time to ever get over, Jesus took care of that. He ended it. The stuff that you think makes you not good enough and not ever actually do anything that matters and never going to get past this. You know what? Jesus ended that. Jesus ended it. He rebuilt the relationship. He restored what had been lost and what the world saw as impossible times. And He ended the disgrace that humanity carried. This in Nehemiah, if we follow the adventure, it's really, it's a spiritual restoration. It's a clarifying of our identity in Christ throughout the whole process. These people, they've been back in town. They turned the, the, the town that God provided. And He rescued them from slavery, from a reality that they chose. And even though God restored them, they still lived in shame. I wonder who I'm talking to right now. Like, Week after week, you get up. Week after week, maybe every couple weeks, whatever your flow is, you get up and you go to church. Maybe you quit doing a couple of things. You pray, and it's real. It's sincere. And even though there's so much that you can look around and say, this has been restored, and this has been restored, and God did this for me. And you can see things that are coming back together. And in the midst of living in that restoration, we can still so easily live in shame, thinking, well, there are some areas that just have no hope, and so I just have to live with the disgrace. I should not have made those choices, but it's too late now. And I like what Paul comes along and says, no! In all these things, we are more than, con than a conqueror. The problem so often, I wouldn't say this very often in church, but sometimes it's just true. 
We never talk about them. But we're going to talk about them. Because sometimes I'm convinced that the problem is not always you, us, whatever, individual, we. The problem sometimes is others. You know what that, you know what it's like? I mean, watch, watch this in Nehemiah coming up in the next verse here in chapter 2. So everybody's like, yeah, let's rebuild it, baby. Let's do it. We've been here for a couple of decades doing nothing, but you inspired hope in us. I think we can. Verse 19 says, but when Samballot, Tobiah, and they made a recruit, Geshem, the Arab, heard of our plan, they scoffed, made fun of them. They said, notice what they said. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? I'm sorry, did they miss all the armed guards coming into town? Are you rebelling against the king, they asked. Next verse. I replied, Nehemiah says, the God of heaven will help us succeed. And we, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall. But you, you've got no share. You've got no legal right. And you've got no historic claim in anything that's going on right here. Do you know what that's like? Like, you finally take the step. You finally, I mean, you took the step. And all the church folk were like, yeah, baby. Awesome. So proud of you. That's so good. You're not going to regret it. We're with you. It's the you belong. Welcome home. Man, best decision you ever made. I'm so proud. My grandma been praying for you for long. Whatever it is. And they cheer you on. But then there were others who said, hypocrite. Who do you think you are? You, oh, you all good now, huh? Like, they're going to, well, you just wait. They're going to see the real you one day. I mean, like, who do you think you are? And rebellion and trying to pretend like you're somebody you're not. We know who you are. And just as Nehemiah had the king's support, but he was still being accused of rebellion against the king. And so it is for the people that it's the God of heaven who gave his son for you. You know what? The opinion aren't your dictator any longer. They're just the opinion. If God is for you, then you know what? It's enough. It's enough that he sent his son to end the disgrace. He didn't bring you to leave you. The disgrace, the beautiful thing about the disgrace is it is traded in for his grace, for getting way beyond what we deserve. They're going to see the real you. No, I'm just learning about the real me. I've never known the real me before. I've been trying to find me all my life, and I'm just finding out who I really am. Because I'm finding out, you know what? I'm not living any longer getting what I deserve. I'm living with Jesus giving me what he deserves. And I can't explain it. And I can't understand it. But I sure do enjoy it. So yeah, I guess those church folk are going to see the real me. And I hope you see the real me too. Because the real me now is not the me you used to know. Their opinions are not the dictator. You know what? Nehemiah told him, said, the king supports me. I see the shame. But I know what God can do. So he said, let's end this disgrace. And today, to the one that carries the pain of the burden of believing what God can do, and yet the pain of what you're accused of when your intentions are very sincere. So you're not perfect. Jesus covered that. So you've quit before. Jesus covered that. So you've failed before. Well, you know what? Jesus covered that. Jesus covered it. So you, you don't know all the steps that are ahead and all the steps that are coming. I'm pretty sure the, the writer of Romans wasn't thinking, oh, well, I know every tactic they're going to use to try to kill me today, and that's why I have victory, because I already know exactly how it's going to come. So I know not to go around that corner at 3 o'clock. I'm just going to go a little earlier before they get there. No, he didn't, he didn't know the plan. He just knew, you know what, no matter what comes, facing death daily, Every method that would ever be tried, Jesus has already covered it. Because with Jesus, in all these things, with the support of the King, and the King, the King, the King of Kings, you know what? You are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who loved you and who gave Himself for you. Rise up. 
but in, get over the past of what you see. That today the disgrace ends. Jesus the King, no matter where you have been, no matter what you have done, no matter who you were this morning, no matter what you were thinking when you come in the door, no matter what you were doing when the music started earlier, when we got up in baby dedication, no matter where, where you've been, any moment up till now. A single transition of moving from a religion of, well, this is what we do, to a relationship of Jesus, whatever comes, I trust you now. That single transfer of belief changes everything instantly. We don't become overcomers because of what we overcome. We become overcomers because of faith in the one who already overcame. It's an identity. It's a new identity. Is it weird? Yeah. Does it take getting used to? Yeah. But you know what? Good things grow with time too. It's not just bad things get worse. Good things get better. So you know what? Work through the awkwardness. Work through the awkwardness of the very first step of like, it's really that easy if I just believe. Well, Arthur Romans said, 10, 13, he says, whoever believes on the Lord shall be saved. Right before that, in verse 11, he says, whoever believes on the Lord will not be disappointed. Whoever believes on the Lord will not be disappointed after one month, after one year, after memorizing 16 verses, after two, no, just whoever believes will not be disappointed. The same guy who says we're facing death daily is the same guy who says, but I'm not disappointed. Notice the testimony and get some credibility. The same guy who says, Romans 10, 9, 10 says, if we believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and confess that he is risen from death, and we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, he says, you know what? You will be saved. With the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, with confession, and with the mouth, confession is made, resulting in salvation. Righteousness and salvation. What we understand salvation, okay, well, I got a new place in heaven, and God's sitting at home to me, and when I die, the preacher will be able to say, well, they're in a better place. Depending on what we believe now. But you know what? There's something that starts now that's called righteousness. What is righteousness? It's like church words. It's weird. It's disconnected. Well, think of it like this. It's right standing with God. As we were born because of Adam's choice, we made ourselves enemies of God. Like the people in Nehemiah's day, they rejected the freedom God gave, and they, they chose their own path. The enemies come in, took over. They, they rejected the protection of God. They suffered the consequences. And God told them, said, when you wake up, just call, and I'll bring you all back. They woke up. They came to their senses after a good amount of time. They caught Jesus. He brings them from all over the globe, brings them back home. And even though they were restored, they just didn't quite, until Nehemiah showed up, realize how restored they really were. That Sambal and Tobiah, who had been just keeping them under their shoe the whole time, really had no authority. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. two people ran the whole town's belief system. Two people ran their belief of defeat. And just took one guy showing up, courageous enough to say, we got the support of a king. And the supplies have already been provided. The gracious hand of God is on us. That's how we got here. And he didn't get us here to leave us here. He got us here to restore us completely. So in this earth, it's a continual conforming to the image of Christ. It's continually being, it's continually being renewed, continually being renewed. We are brand new, but being renewed daily. In heaven, there'll be perfection. But between here and there, there's just a continual conformity to the image of Christ. But why is it like that? Because you know what? We have a flesh and we have a spirit. And what we're doing today, what we're about to do, is we're going to make a spiritual choice. That says, you know what? The things I've done in the flesh do not determine me anymore. But the choices I'm making by the Spirit right now, the Spirit is what goes on into eternity. And what is also I'm going to allow to rule my life today and bring all things that are of God of life and peace into our life now. And let it overrule the heckler of the flesh. So I wonder if maybe today's your first time to really feel the presence of God that's drawing you and saying, you know what? You're, you connect with the message and you connect with saying, but 
I've never really been in a relationship like that before. I've never, I've, I've been through the, I've been through my Sunday schools and I've been through my Bible clubs and I've been, and I've tried to do things and I've got the Bible app on my phone and we watch a Pure Flix movie every now and then and uh, when God's Not Dead comes out again, we'll take that another cycle. But I've never really had a, I can't say that Jesus has been the influencer of my everyday life. I, you know, I've tried to be good and I've tried to show up for the right things, but today I'm trusting Him. And not knowing what tomorrow looks like, but I'm trusting Him and that's, and that's enough. And today is your very first time to make that kind of decision to say, I'm giving, trusting my life into Jesus. Whatever comes, it's in His hands. And I know He's looking out for my good and He's going to use me to reveal His glory to all those around me. The opinionated and the silent, hopeless. He's going to use me to be a rescuer of those who are hurting. If that's you, with heads bowed and eyes closed all over the place today, you're saying, Dan, today for the very first time in a way I understand, I'm surrendering, I'm trusting my life into Jesus. I believe that he died on the cross, paid for every one of my sins. I believe he rose from the tomb, makes me more than a conqueror because of Christ Jesus who strengthens me even today. And I receive that by faith. I'm choosing that today to follow Christ as he leads. If that is you for the very first time in a way that you understand it, I say that in a way that you actually understand it today. I touch you all over the auditorium. Would you just raise a hand in the air? What we're going to do is the next time, I'm just going to ask you, we're going to pray with you. God bless you. I'm just going to pray with you. I'm not going to lay hands. I'm not going to give you a snake. We're just going to pray from here to there. I touch you all over, all over the auditorium. Welcome home. Today is the day I'm trusting my life radically to Jesus. Awesome. If you will, as a church, let's pray together for people who are giving their lives to Christ. Let's say, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your ever-going patience and love and faithfulness. And today, I choose you. I ask you to be my Savior and my King. Forgive me of my sin. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. What we're about to do is we're going to stand up. We have some people right here in the middle. If you just gave your life to Jesus, what they want to do is they want this book on the screen. They want to give that to you. It helps you with your next step. Get through the awkwardness and get it, make the smooth transition for you. Help you with your next step, where to go. In this worship time, this is your moment. If you gave your life to Christ, you know what? Make a bold step. Step out. Take a radical audacious step. Say, you know what? I'm not just saying it. I'm doing it. I'm going beyond myself. Come out to one of these people in the middle. They were anxious to pray with you. And as soon as the song settles down, we have a baptism that is going to go on. And uh, we'll celebrate that. And we'll wrap up and go home. Is that good? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Lead us on.
Hello. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, we are super excited this morning. Um, Sydney, if you want to go ahead and come on down. My, my dear friend, Sydney. <laughs> Sydney is such a good friend of mine, and um, it's a beautiful story. A few years ago, Sydney came down here to, to teach. Let me hold this for you for a minute. Okay. And, um, and she visited here at Cornerstone, and, and long story short, she has become a part of our family. And um, God has just done such an incredible work. Um, she's such an encourager. She is constantly encouraging us. She, I, I, I can't say enough amazing things. I, I'm so excited to be a part of what God's done in Sydney's life and what he has for her. And um, so um, Sydney wanted to share a little piece with you today about what God's done in her. Um, is it on? It, it's supposed to be on. <laughs> it's my mic up there. All right, cool. I'm going to assume it's on. Um. I thought a lot about what to say, and I thought about all the suffering, and the pain, the tears, uh, the traumas that I could share with you, all of the grave, the stuff that, uh, the moments where you're, you're driven to such despair that what you want is the grave. And um, I thought about that, and I thought this day just really isn't about that. This day feels a lot to me like a wedding, like a commitment, um, and a public commitment to all of you. So I'm looking at all of you guys and saying, I'm, I'm doing my part. I'm going to find my place in the body of Christ. I'm going to do everything I can to be there. And I need all the grace I can get to get there. I'm going to do my best to let love flow, flow through me, to be radical in it, in my finances, in my energy, in my time. I'm going to serve in every capacity that I can figure out to serve. And I'm not going to waste any of it. And I want to encourage you guys to do it too. This thing is, this is an irresistible revolution. Amen. Okay, that's that's right. To. Amen. <laughs> that's right. It's, uh, and this is, this is just a beautiful beginning. Sometimes it feels like the end. About a couple years ago, I would have told you it was the end. It's not the end. It's the beginning. That's right. So Amen. When you're sitting in those chairs, think about what you need to do for the 800 that need to be reached here. That's right. How do we Amen. come together? Sure. To make that happen and go beyond that 800. Because mm -hmm. there's freedom. That's right. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sydney, it is my greatest honor to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Down with the old, up with the new. <laughs> Love you. Love you but I saw it. <laughs> Appreciate you. Father God, we love you so much, God. We thank you that your grace is just, we'll never get over it, Father. We love you, Father. We, we pour ourselves out for you today, God. We ask you, God, to just uh, move in our community, do the work that only you can do. We trust you and we believe you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.